Be sure to check out all of our interviews at athletesangle.com, where you can also find the podcast from all of our past episodes, as well as blogs about the show, including Take 5. We talking about practice. Not a game, not a game. We talking about practice. Practice, man. I mean, how silly is that? Uh, playoffs? Don't talk about playoffs. You kidding me? Playoffs? But they are who we thought they were. And we let them off the hook. I don't really think that me breaking Jerry Rice's record was special. Um, I think shutting you guys up is really what made it special. All right, we are now joined on the line by four-year UCF Golden Knight quarterback Kyle Israel. He's also the Bright House Network college football analyst today here on Athletes Angle where we're talking about the NCAA and all the big mess that they seem to be in with the Cam Newton thing coming into light. Uh, Kyle, first off, in your four years at the UCF and now as an NCAA analyst, what percentage of football players do you believe are perhaps accepting gift or money, gifts or money from a third party? You know, you know, Ryan, that's a good question. Um, I, it, it's hard to put a number on it. It's hard to, to, to put a percentage. I don't know if, that's, that, if you can do that. Um, you know, we'd be ignorant if we said that there weren't gifts or there wasn't money uh, going under the table for some of these college football players here across the country. Um, you know, it's so hard to regulate. It's so hard to keep an eye on every individual player. Uh, across the country. It just really is at the end of the day, and you never know what these kids could be receiving in high school, what their families could be receiving. Um, so yeah, I definitely think it's going on. I definitely think um, it's an issue that's tried to be addressed for years. Um, but at the end of the day, uh, it's very difficult to regulate it. I think the NCAA has done a pretty good job of, of, of doing what they can to make sure it's regulated, but at the end of the day, it comes back to, to the coaches, the 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 position coaches who see these players day in and day out, um, you know, and, and it lies on, on the head coach of each individual institution for his player, um, you know, as much as possible to make sure that they're not uh, doing anything like that. But at the end of the day, it's just really hard to stop, Ryan, and that's why I think he's starting to hear more talks about college athletes being paid. Why do you think it's so important for the NCAA to prevent players from agreeing upon with an agent prior to their graduation? Well, there's a lot of things that go can go into it. A lot of you know, it's, and that would be unfair almost to coaching staff, to universities, for these players to start focusing on the next level and really t- getting into talks, getting into discussions with agents while they're still at the university playing for these schools. Um, you know, it, it, it can go. There's so many different ways. Personally, um, you know, I, I think a lot of it is you can ban these players. You can you can tell these players that they can't talk to agents. But at the end of the day, I have players uh, and friends, friends of mine that have been pursued heavily by agents. And these agents aren't just giving calls on the phone line. These agents are showing up at dorm rooms, knocking on dorm rooms, showing up at apartments, um, waiting for you by your car. You know, there's, it, it, there's just so much of the agents and these agents' runners who are the guys that go out and entice these players to either get into talks with these agents so that the agents' hands are ultimately are, are clean because they're not out there all the time. Now, I'm sure they are some, but not all the time. And, and you get into these discussions with players, it's very difficult for players to avoid this when, when they're showing up on their doorstep. You know, it's a lot easier to ignore a phone call. It's a lot harder to ignore a guy that, that's, that's knocking at your front door um, and asking to talk to you about making you a lot of money. You know, it's difficult. So, you know, the, the NCAA, I, I think the, my, in my opinion and what I would think, and, and I'm not a lawyer, and I don't know all the rules uh, and, and all the things that, that need to be done from that a, a, a lawyer perspective. But if I'm the NFL, I, I I team up with the if I'm the NCAA, I team up with the NFL and say, listen, we need to collaborate on a rule that says that if an agent or agents runners is caught talking to a player coming out of college for the the specific time that he's allowed to then that guy will not, that particular agent will not be allowed to be able to practice and be an agent licensed with the NFL. That's what I think. Because then you're, you're saying, that's how you can control this. That's how you can control that agent from going out and soliciting these players. Um, if the NFL is controlling the agent, 
that's the best possible control that they can have. And if there's a rule that limits these agents from talking to players, and the NFL is, is reprimanding these agents, at that point I think you can start to see um, some of the pressure taken off the student-athlete and more of the pressure on, on the agent and, and making, them, making sure they regulate themselves and their runners. For whatever reason, they seem to be dragging their feet on it. But, I mean, similar stories like this keep coming up every single year about where these agents are doing this stuff, and they're always portrayed as the dirtbags and the athletes as the victims. What share of the blame do you think they actually, the athletes actually deserve in this whole mess? Well, you, you certainly don't see any athletes coming out and accusing agents of things, you know. Um, you know uh, a lot of the time, I, you know, at the end of the day, at the end of the day, the athlete's the one making the decision to whether – to talk to these agents, to, to accept money from these agents, to accept the gifts that are on the table. You know, at the end of the day, it's the athlete accepting it. And so there is a, a certain percentage of responsibility that, that needs to, to go on the athlete's shoulder, that needs to go on the institution's shoulder. Uh, and ultimately, you know, the individuals who raise, raise that student athlete. And, you know, it, it'd, be, it'd be ignorant to say that, that the athlete can't be blamed um, a little bit, and they should be. But at the same time, we're talking about 18- and 22-year-old uh, college students who, are, who have these multimillion-dollar contracts on the table who are being offered 100000 here, 200000 here, 300000 here to come play at our university. We'll take care of your family. You know, to some of these athletes, let's remember, a lot of these athletes coming out of high school don't come from the best situations, from the best households, uh, some, sometimes below poverty line. And you're offering this type of money, these type of opportunities to some of these players, that's hard to turn down. Okay, and I certainly, I, I certainly didn't. I, I came from a, a good family, and, and and certainly didn't have any financial issues growing up. But let me tell you something, Ryan. Somebody came and put three hundred thousand dollars in my face. I'm going to think twice about it before I say no. And I just think that's a natural human instinct. So, you know, at the end of the day, the athletes need to be blamed just a little bit. But, you know, if, if you're going to if you're going to try and stop it, you got to stop it at the agent before it gets to the athlete, and that way you don't even have to entice the athlete in the first place. We're talking to former University of Central Florida Knight quarterback who led the team to their first to a 10-win season and their first ever conference championship back in his heyday, Kyle Israel. Uh, Kyle, now how realistic do you think it is for the NCAA to actually keep itself clean of all this stuff in the future? Or is this simply one of those things that's just going to be a problem from here on out? Well, I think there's ways to make improvements. Um and that's what you have to strive for initially, I think. And from what I can see and from what I can tell, uh, there's improvements to be made. Um, but at the end of the day, it's a business. You never know. You never know what's going on at the, at the top of these organizations um, and what communication is going on and what deals are being made to keep some things the same, to maybe change some things. Um, but I do think the NCAA has to do something. I think they realize they have to do something. Um, the NCAA just seems to be a lot – it moves a lot slower – uh, than something that you would imagine that something this big would move as far as making decisions, changing rules. Um, and I think that in the future, you know, the NCAA is going to have to make changes. Or they're going to have things like this every year. They're going to have discrimination between who should be the national championship with the BCS or should we go to a playoff. They're going to have uh, issues with, with paying their athletes that play for them. I don't know how you regulate paying athletes because if you're going to pay a football player $100,000, why aren't you playing the, st- the star and the All-American on the tennis team the same amount of money? Certainly they're not bringing in the same amount in, but is it fair enough to, to um, you know, punish that star tennis player because they chose to play tennis rather than football? It's very, it's very sticky and it's very messy, and I think that's why it's taking so long. So as long until the NCAA can figure out how to do something like that, how to regulate these agents, um, how to figure out the issue with the financial compensation in college football, uh, where there's always going to be discussions like you and I are having. Um, and I just think it's taking them a little bit longer than most would expect for an organization that big. And until they do make changes, the speculation is always going to be there. Well, you gave us earlier how you'd regulate the agents. How would you re- regulate the money or the, the uh, pushers and stuff from the university giving these guys financial compensation for coming to the school as a recruit? Uh, I would all, you know what, I, I, I thought something kind of funny, and I don't know if it would work or not, but I, I thought of a way to find a way for the NCAA to potentially compensate um, the players in some manner for, for letting the NCAA know who, uh, who's coming and approaching them and, and elicit, soliciting these, these gifts and this, this money. You know, I don't know if that would work. It's an off-the-wall type of thought. 
but I, I think that you're going to have to have an off the wall type of thought to stop the types of things that are happening. So do you, do you, do you compensate these players for turning these agents in, for turning these runners in to the NCAA so that something can be done about this? Um, then you maybe have a player saying, okay, well, I'm not going to be doing anything illegal. I'm going to get compensated for making sure that, that the NCAA knows that these people are coming at me. Why don't I turn, why don't I turn them in? Get compensated for it and still be in with the rule within the rule books of the NCAA and not have any issues on my on my plate. Um, there's just a couple, you know, it's going to take some some sort of out out of the the box type of thought. I don't know if that can happen. It'd be very difficult. But this whole thing is messy, and that's why it's been happening. You know, Marcus Dupree was playing 35, 40 years ago, and those same things are happening today. So it, it's just a part of the sport. It's just one of those parts of the sport that that's really coming to light when your Heisman Trophy candidate the number one team in the country, the best player in our, in our country right now as far as college football is concerned, is under the scrutiny of being paid to come and play college football. And, and that's what's really pushing this into the spotlight for the past couple of weeks, and, and it won't go away until something's done about it. The quarterback from the University of Auburn apparently recruiting himself up, beginning asking every team, what are you going to give us besides a scholarship? Uh, reports say he uh, demanded upwards of one hundred eighty to two hundred thousand dollars from each school to go there to sign a letter of intent. How realistic or how believable do you think these allegations are? Well, I, you know, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna throw any, anybody in front of the bus. Uh, but I will say this: usually, when there's where there's smoke, there's usually fire. Um, you know, do we do we know all the details? No. Am I going to blame or persecute Cam Newton and? say that he doesn't deserve the accolades that he's been receiving this year? No. Um, I'm the type of guy that wants to see the proof before I ever go and blame somebody and hold judgment to somebody um, if they don't deserve it. You know, I don't want to be the guy saying sorry uh, after, you know, I didn't vote for you for the Heisman. And obviously I don't have a Heisman vote, but if I did, I would still be voting for Cam Newton as my guy to win it. Now, if in two weeks it comes out that this was, this was true, and they have extreme proof, and they have everything that you need to um, to make the case that that Cam did receive money to come to Auburn and was soliciting it. Then you know I have a little different um, perception of Cam Newton. But at the end of the day, Ryan, there's no money in the world that's going to give him the ability to do what he's doing on the football field. Um, and so I think he should still be the front runner for the Heisman. I you know I think he's been unfairly um, judged by a lot of the media. I think a lot of the speculation, you know, you know how the media goes as much as I do, you know, one speculation, uh, you know, it could change form into to 10 different speculations um, just by word of mouth. And so you have to remember all those things. Uh, you have to have a level, level-headed approach if you're going to try to make a decision whether you think somebody's uh, guilty of these allegations or not. Um, but at the same time, you know, I'm not, gonna, I'm not going to believe anything until I see uh, – the final, the final documents, the final proof that, that this was going on. Uh, and until then, you know, all it's doing is ruining, uh, you know, probably one of the best years by one single athlete that you've ever seen in college football. And, and he's playing in the best conference in college football but against the best competition. Uh, and he's dominating. And he's doing it at the quarterback's uh, position. So I think Cam Newton it, it deserves all the credit that, he, that, that he's received right now. I think he deserves all the attention. And hopefully here soon there will be more positive attention than negative attention. Um, and, and hopefully we'll find out uh, in one way or the other uh, whether these allegations are true. Kyle Israel, former quarterback from the University of Central Florida, now hosts Alumni Live every Wednesday and Saturday. You can check it out at alumnilive.com. Kyle, thanks a lot for joining us here today on Athletes Angle. Thanks, Ryan, for having me. And uh, I'm happy to be to come. So there you have it, folks. Thanks for listening to Athletes Angle with Ryan Carrett here on 101.5 UMFM.